everyone, and thanks for joining us for the School Transportation Nation podcast. I am Tony Corpin, publisher of STN. This episode is brought to you by TransFinder, the leader in school bus routing software. And this week's tech tip is brought to you by Zonar. And I'm Ryan Gray, Editor-in-Chief of School Transportation News. Thanks again for joining us. A little bit later, we'll hear from Steve Leslie, the Director of Transportation for School District of Osceola in Wisconsin, as well as Francine Furby, the Transportation Director of Fairfax County Public Schools in Virginia, to hear about how their operations are preparing for a post-COVID-19 world. Thanks for that, Ryan. Man, lots going on as usual. Uh, We're here in California. We've got some uh, really interesting news to share. You want to bring our audience up to speed? Yes. Well, we reside in Los Angeles County here in Southern California. It's the most populous county in the nation. So about by about a two to one margin with over 10 and a half million people just in our enclave. And the LA County Office of Education released guidance last week to 80 area school districts on everything from reopening schools to transportation, communication, mental health, you know, the list goes on and on. So obviously with transportation, this is going to be affecting literally thousands of school buses. There's about 29,000 school buses in the state. Very big number of those are in Los Angeles County. So this is a bellwether, if, if you will, for the rest of the nation as well, giving guidance on top of some initial information we've received from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as some states are now are issuing some guidelines. California's state guidelines will not be coming out for the next couple of weeks, uh, later in June. But Los Angeles County certainly uh, issued some interesting recommendations. And, you know, really there, from a planning implication standpoint, we're hearing and, and seeing what we've been talking about with school districts for the, the past couple of months. Additional buses may be needed to transport all the students. School districts need to consider time needed for infection control. Protocol and procedures must be consistent with neighboring school districts. They need to be tracking their costs and expenditures, of course. You know, you know, and when it comes to school bus routes, how are all these tiered changes in, in bell times or split schedules, additional runs? What's that going to do to bus routing? Is that going to uh, necessitate the purchase of additional school buses? Uh, in terms of contractors, it, it suggests identifying if a vendor should initiate cleaning and disinfecting protocols during driver training tracking costs and expenditures of that, determining, here's a big one, if the driver job description includes cleaning. Sometimes it might, sometimes it might not, certainly not at the the level of what we've been talking about with disinfecting school buses and, and sanitizing them with wipes or misters or, you know, the frequency of doing those kind of things. And also talking about identifying the availability of PPE for employees. And then, of course, you know, talking about what we've been talking about a lot as well, communication with staff, parents, students and stakeholders on what these new procedures and efforts look like. You can read an article up on our website at s10online.com. We link to this uh, pretty long document. Transportation is is discussed on page 38. So you can find that article written by our reporter and editor extraordinaire, Taylor Hannon. Again, little by little, Tony, the industry is starting to get a little bit more information or direction on where they might need to go. Yeah, super interesting. I know a lot of people I've been talking to, they're adding, you know, hand sanitizers stations on all the school buses. We're hearing from lots of people considering that. And even when the regulations maybe ease, I I don't see some of those things going away. Maybe PPE might go away, but, you know, cleaning protocols, safety protocols, disinfecting. I feel like that that's something that's going to be staying around for quite a while. And I don't know if I see the school bus driver suiting up in the uh, in the hazmat suit, uh, shooting the electrostatic sprayer around the school bus as part of the normal job function. I think uh, that's something that the district transportation offices are going to really have to look hard at if that's really something that they're going to expect drivers to do in addition to the laundry list of things that they do already, or maybe that's uh, maybe additional pay as compensatory based on additional services work. So really interesting to see how that kind of story plays out. Ryan, you want to share what some of the other states are doing in preparation? Maybe that's bills or, you know, other things you're hearing in the, uh, in the universe of school transportation? 
Yes. Yeah, so Ohio actually uh, introduced a bill a couple of weeks ago uh, about erecting dividers on school buses to separate the drivers from the students. We're talking about those spit guards that they're what they're calling them that you see at the grocery store or at the bank or, or whatnot to set up a barrier to eliminate or at least reduce the chances of contracting illness through spittle or bodily fluids, kind of gross stuff. But that's the the new world we live in now. Uh, So that one, it just was introduced last month in May. So we'll see where that proceeds. Still pretty early on, but certainly a lot of school districts and states are looking at the possibility of this. Now that brings to the table a lot of additional challenges though. And, and Francine Furby from Fairfax County Public Schools in Virginia will touch on this a little bit later, but you got to look at the cost of obviously, but you know, there, there's so many different types of school buses out there. You can't just willy nilly be going on and inserting or implementing, erecting these barriers. And what kind of uh, material will this barrier be made of? Will it be transparent? How easily will it be clean? Does it uh, provide any obstructions to the driver view? Those sorts of things. And then you got to think about, you know, with state specs, whether that be the California Highway Patrol here in California or in Ohio's case, the Ohio, Ohio uh, Highway Patrol, state police, the Department of Motor Vehicles, whatever the entity is that is inspecting school buses, that, that has to be on their list and they have to approve those. So it's not just as easy as just saying, hey, we're going to do this. So I think that's one of the reasons why we see an actual bill in Ohio that's been introduced to affect that kind of change. We really just have to see how this all plays out still. I feel like a broken record saying that, but unfortunately, uh, we're still feeling our way through the dark on this thing. Yeah, right. I mean, one of the interesting things, I feel like trying to re-engineer the school bus driver compartment might be a little aggressive, right? That that doesn't feel like an easy uh, thing to do. I mean, I think a much easier solution is maybe getting a face shield, like kind of what they're using in the hospitals with physicians and doctors, and maybe that's gloves and additional PPE to protect the driver versus erecting some uh, static thing. And what's the engineering involved to actually bolt that thing to the floor? Is it safe? Could it become a projectile? I mean, who knows? Those are just things that become real more complicated. And I don't know if we're just, we're throwing too much cure at it, right? Like, is is that just overkill? So I would really challenge uh, maybe that thought process and say, hey, could we look at a, a kind of an easier, more modular solution, like a face shield and additional PPE for the driver and, um, you know, all the acronyms these days, you know, other states too, Ryan, I mean, uh, I think there's some different stuff going on in tech. Texas, we keep hearing a lot out of Texas more and more because I think, like Kane said, Kane Smith, director of transportation at at SciFair in Houston, they're really looking at starting up soon and and they're getting ready. Yeah, well, Texas gave uh, direction to all the districts in the state that they can proceed with in-person summer school classes that started here in the the beginning of of June. Now, with that, again, the districts will have the ultimate decision on how they want to proceed with that. But certainly the Texas Education Agency and Governor Abbott there said they they have the, the ability to continue on. So we'll really see how that goes. With that said, you know, with the guidance, school systems, they need to look at reducing the number of students students on a bus route, because obviously, if the kids are able to go to in person classing, that means that's opening up the school busing, potentially, they're asking districts to consider grouping bus routes to align to class groupings to minimize that cross group exposure, students, teachers and staff should use hand sanitizer upon boarding the bus, students should be seated at least six feet from other students on the bus. Uh, In most cases, this will mean one student per row on opposite sides of the bus. So a little bit along the lines of what the CDC was recommending, encouraging families to drop students off, carpool or even walk with their student to school to reduce the possible virus exposure on buses. And, And buses should be thoroughly cleaned after each bus trip, particularly high touch surfaces such as bus seats, steering wheels, knobs and door handles. During the cleaning, open up those windows to allow for additional ventilation and airflow which could be helpful in mitigating COVID-19 spread. And, you know, and and I was talking with one of our readers and one of our consultants uh, last week about ventilation. And he made a really good point where we already do have ventilation on school buses, 
what would be the feasibility of increasing those? Um, so that that would be something that the OEMs are certainly looking at, or, or maybe they're not. And maybe this is something that our listeners can talk to their bus dealers about and say, what are our options? Um, how easy is that? Is there, are there already options that, that we can utilize to, to further ventilate the bus? Of course, there's the windows. There's a lot of windows on a school bus. So it's just looking at everything that, that potentially could ease operations, ease the, ease the management and maintenance of those operations, just to, to also bring peace of mind to the students, the drivers, monitors, and, and, and parents. Yeah, Ryan. And I think people definitely need to be focused on helping keeping their students safe and minimizing the germ risk. Our tech tip today is brought to you by Zonar, a leader in smart fleet management. Your buses will carry students again soon. Does your fleet have the tech to protect them? Use this summer to make sure you do. Talk to a pro about modern ridership tracking, verification, and management, and student-managed card systems that limit the exposure to germs. While you're at it, learn about mobile app for parents to track their child's bus route without calling you. Learn more at zonarsystems.com slash restart. That's zonarsystems dot com slash restart friends i also want to remind you uh stn expo reno has been rescheduled to august 29th through september 2nd we'll have a whole new educational format really focused on uh how to get you guys up to speed for coronavirus what to do all the challenges you know conferences that we put on number one reason people go is networking clearly some people can go some people can't because of school startup not sure school starts going to quite look the same as as normal as we've always seen it uh, but you know we, we want to bring people together and and we want to do our best to have a nice safe environment for everyone one. Additionally, you know, we have STN Expo Indianapolis. That's going to be taking place October 8th through the 13th in Indianapolis of all places. And so we really look forward to seeing at one of those. You know, Ryan's putting together a stellar educational program for all of those on how to focus on surviving uh, COVID-19. And, you know, Ryan, you want to share a little more with us about what people should be thinking about? Sure. Well, you know, in terms of the the content, yeah, surviving and thriving is kind of, you know, where I'm going with this uh, content and, and thriving in, in, in terms of the opportunities. We've been talking about that. I actually wrote about that. That was the subject of my column in the April issue. Wrote that right as this thing was really hitting and all the schools first started closing across the nation. And really, you know, utilizing resiliency. This is a resilient industry. We have a lot thrown at us day in and day out. We need to, to do our best to be open to the possibilities, open to the opportunities. This is definitely an impetus to help push the industry towards evolving more. So, you know, that's really going to be the message in Reno, as well as we're going to be tailoring a lot of STN Expo Indianapolis, which we produce in conjunction with School Transportation Association of Indiana. So they have their all their members there as well. And also to the Transporting Students with Disabilities and Special Needs Conference, which we will also be holding concurrently with STN Expo Indy. Uh, really, obviously, everyone needs to know and wants to know right now, how do they move forward from busing students with special needs and what that looks like to maintaining the buses, cleaning them, sanitizing them, routing, utilizing KPIs and data to, to really get out in front of issues and to make your case for your budgets, especially at this time when we're hearing about budgets being slashed, making sure that education is not a part of those and that school busing is not affected. Because again, if we can't get the kids to school, then where are we? We obviously have online distance learning that has really come to the forefront that school districts are utilizing as well. I think we'll continue to see some of that in the, in the new school year, especially in maybe some of the hotbed areas along the Eastern Corridor, on the Eastern Seaboard, maybe in some parts of California. But definitely everyone's trying to, to get back to that new normal. So that's really where the direction is going uh, for our conferences. So hopefully you guys can all make it. I uh, would love to see you. We'll have a lot of safeguards in place with physical distancing of, a cl of our classroom. We're going to a new format in Reno, especially, at least for Reno, in late August and early September, where... We will be going to a symposium format instead of having the breakouts. We'll have just an all day symposium that's kicked off by our keynote addresses. You know, obviously, like Tony, you said, everyone comes to conferences for networking, but we realize that many people this year can't come, 
won't come for whatever reason. So we will be introducing some online distance learning ourselves. So stay tuned for details on that. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate it. Your partnerships are going to be very important right now. And I want to bring on our next podcast guest, Steve Leslie at School District of Osceola in Wisconsin. Steve, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Well, we want to pick your brain a little bit about what you're doing in preparation for fall school startup. Give us a little background on you guys. Sure. Uh, The School District of Osceola is about... 1,700 students, and we transport about 1,300 of them. In preparation, we're kind of following the the CDC guidelines as far as how many kids you can have on a bus, the social distancing. And even as a school district, we're not quite certain how we're going to fully implement all of our classroom. Uh, We're looking at uh, doing some distance learning, some virtual learning. That's going to reduce the number of kids we have. So the next step is to find out on a fleet of 19 routes and one special ed, how are we going to get the 1,300 kids to school with uh, social distancing out of a school bus that will give you about 13 kids the way the CDC is spelling it out. We're talking about Uh, One student per seat with a space on the next seat, and they have to be six feet apart. So we're we're really only utilizing 13 out of 26 seats in a school bus. So we're going to look at possibly some tiering, you know, multiple tiers. At At this time, we transport all age groups on the same route, and we're mostly rural. So we're about 120 square miles of route in this area. So we're looked, we're just looking at ways to to get people to school in a timely fashion. So routing systems are going to be really important to find ways to do it. It's my understanding that you're using uh, Transfinders Route Finder Plus, their brand new product. How are you using that product right now? What do you think of it? Well, having just learned it, what I like about it is it has optimization tools that I can put in the criteria that I want and I can set it in motion to take that criteria and put it into play. And and so I can start with the routes that I have so I'm not reduplicating work. And it'll give me options based on the criteria I put in where it'll tell me how many additional routes will have to go with that one route. So if I can optimize it by adding two routes to the area or a second tier or even a third tier, it will do that work for me and it'll allow me to create multiple options to look at. Interesting. How did you guys learn that? Did you take some classes? Did you go to a a special training seminar? What was involved in trying to get up to speed on on that new product? It was uh, kind of a nice situation. They set up a two eight-hour day training on Transfinder University where they had two trainers that basically walked us through each one of the components. It's got multiple, you know, student data. It's got mapping. It's got resource scheduler. And they went through all of those different components and showed us with their knowledge of being able to move around in it, how to work with the data. What I liked was it was very similar to RouteFinder Pro, which is their the predecessor. It was a lot more intuitive. And so the classroom, what we were able to see somebody working with it in addition to having the same data and trying the things in front of it. That's what's so nice about that program. Excellent. Very helpful information, Steve. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Stay tuned to hear how Fairfax County Public Schools in Virginia is preparing for school startup. Ryan Gray and Francine Furby are going to talk about all things going on there. Friends, welcome back. We are pleased today to be joined by Francine Furby, Transportation Director for Fairfax Public Schools in Virginia, one of the top five in the nation, huge operation out there in the metro Washington, D.C. area, 1,625 buses, one of the largest county-owned fleets in the nation. Francine, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Glad to be here. So we know that you guys have a lot of work cut out for yourselves uh, getting prepared for the new school year. The last couple of weeks, there was some guidance uh, released on how to do that. Can you take us through that a little bit? Yes, uh, we are working with a group of uh, our leadership, senior leadership on a task force that was put together. And so the task force has been charged with Uh, several scenarios to look at and uh, bringing back uh, to the task force what impacts 
uh, these scenarios would have on the various departments within the school district. And so uh, we're meeting weekly and hope to have a final report out to the school board on June 15th. Okay, so coming up here. Now, I I did see in the guidance that you guys have done some calculations, it looks like, on what passenger capacity reductions may be here for a full-size bus that normally seats uh, 77 students. It's looking like there could be a 67% reduction capacity for elementary and 50% for middle and high schools. And then for smaller buses, probably about a 50% reduction for elementary schools. How did your team go about about coming up with those calculations? So we look at the number of students that we transport. And of course, we also understand what the capacity is for those buses. And so with that, we have a formula that will allow us to look at full capacity. And when we say full capacity, we're looking at three students per seat. Uh, and that is for our elementary uh, group. And then two students per seat for the middle and high school. So as you said, the uh, large bus uh, holds 77 passengers. And uh, with, you know, the assignments that we have, we looked at those numbers and saw what it would take to actually uh, reduce the capacity in compliance with social distancing. And so we're looking at providing one student per seat at each level. And um, we know that with some of the scenarios that we've looked at, we would be able to achieve this, this social distancing. However, within uh, some of the scenarios that we're looking at to comply with social distancing, it would require us to add additional buses to the fleet. Yeah, I, I saw that in the recommendations as well. So with that, so you, you'd be looking at doing multiple runs per day or in the morning, afternoon? Correct. We currently have four tiers with our bell schedule. So a bus will, a bus driver will transport middle school students and then high school students, and then some will transport two loads of elementary students. And we anticipate being able to complete that entire bell schedule without any changes. We will look at the possibility of, you know, modifying on the elementary level because we're going to have to factor in time for our drivers to clean the bus between routes. We're going to have to work with our students in practicing, you know, social distancing when they're loading the bus, when they're unloading the bus at the schools. We'll be monitoring the use of the masks on uh, with students as long as those guidelines from the CDC require that, you know, we have to factor in additional time for those measures. And so we do anticipate the bell schedule being adjusted just a little bit. That's what we're looking at. That's what we're presenting in our scenarios. Gotcha. And then it looks like uh, from what the district has come up with, it looks like it's going to be over $6 million expected to be paid for PPE, additional custodial staffing, additional cleaning supplies, an increase in public health nurses to, of course, you know, monitor student health at school. Can you give me an indication of what your costs are looking like for transportation amid all of these changes? Well, when when we look at adding additional time for drivers and attendants, like I had mentioned about an hour, 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes in the afternoon, we're looking at an annual cost of about $13 million. Uh, That doesn't include the PPE, that's just in in, uh, overtime salary. And so if we're looking at adding buses, that number will increase. One one scenario that we looked at, we would need to add 52 buses for the elementary level. You know, with that total, as well as the additional time for drivers, we're looking at over 21 million, almost $22 million. So it is a significant cost. Further, if we, if we looked at a scenario with transporting, you know, all students, 100% of the student population, Uh, we would be looking at increasing our fleet by 779 additional buses. And so we know that those numbers just are not attainable. And so that's why we're working with the different task force members to include instruction, to include facilities, DIT, so that we can work on a plan that really will work for the district in considering everyone's needs as well as the students' needs. 
Gotcha. And, and then I, I know that part of this is reviewing walk to school distances as well. In 2008, after the, the, the recession, a lot of districts, and even before then, were looking at lengthening the walk distances. In other words, reducing school bus service. Looks like that's on the table as well as everything under the sun. Have, have there been discussions, though, about limiting transportation to just those students that require it vis-a-vis the, the students with IEPs, homeless, foster youth? Title I, those kind of programs? We had been asked to look at expanding the walk boundaries, but as far as eliminating uh, bus service to a group of students, no. There had been talk about uh, looking at a scenario where we may bring our most neediest students in, but that wouldn't be with, you know, eliminating uh, bus service. I would be, you know, with the bus service available to them. Gotcha. And then also kind of expanding on the students with disabilities angle, obviously with the social distancing, that's challenging enough. But when you're trying to to accomplish that with special needs routes, what kind of challenges and things are you looking at right now in terms of being able to have monitors on the bus and they're supposed to be sitting right next to the students. They're supposed to be helping them into child safety restraint systems, assisting the driver with wheelchair securements. What is that looking like? So we would have to provide the personal protective equipment for our staff. We've been looking at face shields for our attendants on the bus, as well as gloves and providing, you know, uh, cleaning materials for them. But we do know that it's something that our staff needs to be able to provide that level of service to our students. As far as uh, seating on a special needs bus, we typically have fewer students on our special needs buses. And so being able to set them with social distancing in mind can be better achieved with um, our smaller special needs buses. But there you go back to, you know, requiring the um, personal protective equipment for our staff to help keep them safe and have some type of a barrier between uh, them and the student. Speaking of barriers, uh, a lot of school districts are talking about, anyways, the possibility of erecting plexiglass, you know, spit barriers, kind of like what you see at your Walgreens or your supermarket. Are there any conversations either at the Fairfax public schools level or the state level about requiring such dividers between bus drivers and students? That did come up um, with our driver association group. And so I reached out to the state and inquired to see if such, uh, you know, materials or device would be acceptable. And at the time, we were told that because of obstruction with the view, with making turns, receiving students, and with students and disembarking the bus, that was not approved at this time. Uh, There is also a concern with the materials that would be used and if they would be flame retardant. So um, I know that the state is working with various task force groups as well, looking to provide as much information and guidance as possible. And so we do lean on them and look to them for advice and for guidance. Okay. And then uh, back to the nurses, Uh, it looks like there's a little over half a million dollars uh, that's going to be made available in the budget for public health nurses to assist with monitoring student health at school. Does that extend to the school bus stop? Because a lot of our readers are very concerned when they're seeing the CDC recommendations and and different, you know, guidelines or recommendations from different public health entities about making sure that students don't go to school with fevers or have, have signs or symptoms of COVID. COVID-19 or or other illnesses for that matter. But how does that parlay to the school bus experience? I mean, are you guys looking at screening students before they get on the bus? And if so, is that a driver responsibility or, you know, are we talking about having nurses on every route? So at this point, our liaison with the local health department has stated that, you know, they are still working with the local health department and CDC on those guidelines. We did factor in cost for drivers to have temperature thermometers available for students. But at this time, that has not yet been confirmed if that will be the responsibility of the bus driver or will that be the responsibility of another health official. 
Okay. And, and a lot of other questions that are regarding that bus stop. Many school districts already do or should have policies in place if a child reports to the school bus stop and either misses the bus or for whatever reason can't get on the bus. Maybe they've been suspended and they try to get on and they're not allowed on. There should be some kind of policy in place for what do you do with that student? Do you just leave them there? Do you, you know, so I would imagine that also comes to play with this kind of conversation. That is correct. We would have to have protocols set for our drivers to follow. We are working on protocols uh, from a transportation aspect where we are putting together guidelines for our drivers as far as seating, how to identify the seats that the students will be available uh, to sit in, and then monitoring the use of the masks and, you know, if we will provide masks for students that dropped theirs or lost theirs or forgot their mask. So there's things that we're working on so that we can have tools available for the drivers to reference and, you know, to support them. Okay, thanks. Uh, and so it appears, I know that a lot of school districts are ramping up for summer school right now. And I saw some mention of your, quite, pretty extensive mention actually of your, of your summer programs. It looks like everything is really staying online for the next couple of months through the summer. That is correct. For the month of June and July, we know that there will be a virtual learning provided uh, over the summer. We are looking at some later August programs still yet that uh, may be considered for face-to-face -face instruction, but that has not been yet determined. Okay, so I guess if there's a silver lining for you and your team, it's that you have a little bit of time. You don't have to figure this out by next week or, or in the next couple of weeks, right? Well, you know, we are uh, wanting to get some direction so that we can prepare. Um, we do have a small group of drivers that have been supporting our food delivery service. We're also working on supporting the schools with, um, you know, moving buses as necessary so that they can conduct certain supports such as laptop uh, delivery and laptop return so we do have a little bit of activity out there with drivers on their buses, but our drivers are, are really eager to come back and uh, to get back to normalcy. And we're eager to see them. Oh, everyone's looking for normalcy. That's for sure. Francine Furby, thank you so much for joining us today. I know you're super busy trying to wrap your head around this and provide that great leadership to your team. You're welcome, Ryan. Let's stay in touch. Look forward to it. Thank you very much. and Stay safe. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Join us next week on the School Transportation Nation podcast for the latest updates on COVID-19, as well as where the industry is headed from here. I want to thank again, Steve Leslie, the Director of Transportation for the School District of Osceola in Wisconsin for speaking with Tony, as well as Francine Furby, Director of Transportation for Fairfax County Public Schools in Virginia. Got a lot of great information and we're going to continue on with that. Be sure to stay tuned to stnonline.com for the latest and greatest in how school districts are preparing. And please remember to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss a thing. Also want to thank again our sponsors, TransFinder and Zonar. Stay safe and we'll see you next time.